and you did a great job. And I'm sorry that it didn't work out properly for you. But it was kind of interesting how this came along. And, and the interesting part was that as I looked back on it, if I put myself in any one of those places, from the politician that first started it, to the head of the Forest Service, to the loggers, to the man that, that probably borrowed his last dime was starting that logging mill, and he thought he was going to get X amount of board foot, and he didn't get X, he got Y. I could, I could see all the way, I could see the environmental groups. Why did they get started? They had a good reason. I would have done the same thing they did. And in the end, I could see the big circle and how it came about. And from now on, I don't have that anger. I could see that everybody made the choices, and they made the right choices at the time they were there for what they knew. And today, I think we're at that same crossroad. It's time for us to look forward. What we've been doing isn't working. We need to come up with a new plan. We need to move forward. Are we going to make some mistakes? We are, for sure. But today, hopefully, we've got some good panels up here that are going to talk about how we could move forward today and how we could get rid of this anger. And I, when we open up the mic to people to come up and talk, I know there's going to be a lot of you that are very passionate on both sides of the issue. And what I'm going to ask you is to be very respectful. I do not want people to come up here. I do not want them to use foul language. I want them to be, you know, respectful. And I think that's the real key issue here. What we're trying to do with this movement is take back the moral high ground. I think that we need to move in that direction. So without any further discussion, I'd like to open it up to Sunny. And uh, after Sunny and make the presentation, then we're going to open the mic. We're going to bring it out there and let you ask questions of the people here. We're going to try to make it go quickly, about one or minute, two minutes per person, and uh, let you talk a little later. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Thanks to all of you. There's still some more seats over here. They are front row seats. It's not church, so there are, there's four or five over here and a few scattered around if you, if you want to sit down. But thanks to everybody for especially missing the Patriots Colts game. Or the majority of it anyway. I know, I know. That's tough competition, but it, it shows that you've got an awful lot of a strong feeling about this topic. And I want to re reiterate what Tom said about we're, we're not in the blame game today. We're not, as I said in an article in the paper, it's okay to look back as long as you don't stare. So we're going to do some looking <laughs> back today with, with some of the panel members and, as to how we got to where we are when it comes to vegetation growth. We don't want to look back and try to lay blame on anybody for where we are because that blame can be shared by an awful lot of folks. An awful lot of folks. So that's not the objective. The objective is to figure out how do we go forward. We have a crisis in our national forests. Not just the Bitterroot, but a lot of western national forests are in a crisis situation. Whether it's the brush fields of California, or whether it's the, the overgrown forest that we have here, we have a crisis and we need to do something about it. We need to be proactive. Uh, and right now we're somewhat reactive and it's costing this past season $1.34 billion to be reactive. And so we need to be proactive. But again, we're not here to blame anybody. We're also not going to talk about wolves. Okay? <laughs> and we're not going to talk about off-road vehicles. Okay, and we're not going to talk about string setbacks. We're focusing on one topic and one topic only. And it would be great if you would respect everybody here that came here to deal with that topic, to stick to that topic in your questions and in your comments. Can we all agree to that? Yeah. yeah. Great. We have four panelists up here that, uh, that two have some similar backgrounds and the other two have very different backgrounds, but it's, it's all intended from an education standpoint to give you an idea of what happens with vegetation, uh, impact on the county, and, and impact on our personal health. And so our, our first presenter is Jack Lucinski. Jack came here in 1968. Uh, I've been living up the West Fork about three years when Jack came. 
and uh, we, we became uh, great, great partners, uh, although opposing partners in this case. But Jack has 35 years with the Forest Service. His title, and, I, and I, if any of you are taking notes, get ready. His, his title is Historical Vegetation and Fire Ecologist. And so he has a slide program that is, is very interesting to show you what happens over 80, 90, 100 years when it comes to vegetation. So Jack, it's all yours. Thank you, Sonny. As Sonny said, I have had an opportunity to look at a few um, pictures over the years. In fact, for the last 25 years, um, part of my job was going back and finding examples of, of vegetation as it looked like at the time of, of settlement here when, when the Euro-Americans came into the valley. And then compare that to what our present situation is, to, to get a handle on what's going on in, in our vegetation. I probably have looked at basically thousands of photographs in that time frame. And most of them are found between the periods of 1870 and the early 1900s. One of the main repositories that I utilized was the United States Geological Service Photo Library in Denver, Colorado. Excellent resource. There's literally tens of thousands of pictures that were taken as part of the old government surveys throughout the country. And they also did uh, photographic surveys when they were setting the, the uh, corners for the townships and ranges that they worked for the area. So this provides a resource of the entire, basically, Western United States in all kinds of education sites. The University of Montana also has a very extensive library of old photographs, as well as to all the other universities scattered through the Northwest. And I've had an opportunity to look at many of those. After reviewing that, I selected about 130 uh, positions that we could possibly find on the ground, and we spent uh, a couple years going back to those sites and re-photographing them and taking a, a look at what changes have occurred over time. And we're not going to be able to look at all those that uh, I was able to revisit. Um, and so we'll just have to take a few small samples of those just to give you a, an idea of what kind of change has occurred. Uh, if any of you are interested in, in uh, pursuing this um, and looking at more, I can certainly give you a list of references that you can use to look at uh, some of the publications that have been uh, put out on this subject. Before we look at uh, some of the photographs, we might want to review the kinds of vegetation that we're going to be talking about. Uh, our vegetation here in the valley is really determined by two things, moisture and temperature. Those dictate what grows on any one particular site. The main valley bottom that we live in was dominated by ponderosa pines. Uh, it's a, a tree that can grow in you know, warm conditions and it can tolerate fairly dry conditions. And this was found throughout the valley bottoms and on the, on the warmer uh, slopes up uh, on the foothills uh, around uh, both sides of the valley. As you move up slope,